Thank you for that introduction, and Tim, for your wonderful uh, few words to begin with. I feel a bit like, um, as Nepalis do, when they speak to an audience where they've got an Indian and a Chinese colleague either side of them, they call themselves the yam between two boulders. So here I am between my two esteemed colleagues and, and great mentors in many ways. For today's talk, I've opted for an approach that borrows unashamedly from the United States Declaration of Independence. Namely, that in this gathering, we hold certain truths to be self-evident. That linguistic and cultural diversity is to be celebrated and protected. And concomitantly, that language endangerment is a serious and important issue. I say this in large part because I found these fundamental tenets not always to be common ground. As I discovered to my peril when speaking to public audiences who see, as Tim and Nick have so elegantly explained, the inexorable advance of English and the decline of minority speech forms around the world and the cultural forms that they encode as somehow natural processes. And people who apply a modified Darwinian logic, a phraseology of natural selection to social form and cultural life. Today I want to address issues of field methods, of collaboration, of ethics that Nicholas has take, taken us through, and also of the ownership of cultural and linguistic data that is collected in the field. I believe these issues are best explained and understood through specific and quite concrete examples. So I'm going to start from the local, my own experience in the Himalayas, and then sort of zoom out to the global and talk about the project that I run. I hope the tendencies and the issues that I reflect on will strike a chord with you and those present. Collect, protect, connect. Well, these three verbs, which I've borrowed from the wonderful New Zealand film archive, which has as its mission to collect, protect, and connect New Zealanders with their moving image heritage, also summarize the points that I'd like to make to you today. Collection is the gathering and documentation of cultural or linguistic data in the field, not in an extractive or acquisitive manner, but in a way that is responsible, increasingly collaborative, and predicated on trust not only with participation, but often leadership from local communities. Protection is the archiving and curation of these materials, doing the best we can to ensure that these unique cultural and linguistic documents are maintained, migrated, and refreshed as new technologies become available. The connection, which is in a way the most interesting for me, is made when these materials are returned to source communities, people of origin, and when they reach, reach a wider audience uh, in public, in print, and online. The Karin are a group who live along the Thai-Burma border. And they state and suggest in a saying of theirs that if you lose your money, you've lost something. If you lose your house and property, you've lost something very important. If you lose your country, you'll have suffered a great loss. But if you lose your culture and your language, then you've lost everything. And I think the drama of these stories that we've heard about already today, and I'm going to touch on, I'm sure Peter will develop, is that it's only really at the cusp of disappearance that you realize what you're losing. This statement may appear quite anachronistic in the context of a globalized, industrialized world, but this is a feeling that is shared by many communities that I know, at least in the Himalayas, and I think more widely. Let's have some brutal and cold, hard facts. Well, facts, how about stylized facts or factoids? Because these things, of course, are terribly disputed. But according to UNESCO expert groups, about 97% of the world's people speak about 4% of the languages. And conversely, about 96% of the world's languages are spoken by about 3% of its people. This is a huge disparity. And concomitantly, a lot of the world's linguistic diversity then is actually being stewarded by very, very few people. And there is, I think, a feeling among linguists and the people who watch these things that a large amount of the world's linguistic diversity will probably be lost in the next 100 years. Language death. Well, Nick has talked about some of the push and pull factors that lead to languages dying, and also alluded to this very interesting idea of predator languages or dominant languages. Some linguists even talk of linguicide, languages that somehow either kill themselves off or, more commonly, are killed off by other languages. But let's recall that not all languages die or become endangered in the same way. Sometimes a community themselves die, but the language lives on. Other times the people die and the language dies. Other times the language dies, but the people live on. Language shifts. They move to speaking, of course, another language. 
Now, species and languages are often compared. And there's um, a professor at the University of Cambridge who's focused as a conservation biologist uh, quite recently on how linguists adopt biological metaphors, really, to gain traction for their explanations of linguistic diversity and endangerment. But they are not the same. We may talk about extinction, vulnerability, endangerment, words that are very common to biologists. But there are no captive breeding programs for languages. What are linguists doing? Well, I'm delighted to say quite a lot. I was intrigued and also sort of heartened to hear Tim's comments about archaeology, which we hear about so much, and where's the visibility for linguists and linguistics in general. I would turn it around, actually, and say, from the perspective of a social anthropologist, not an antisocial anthropologist, I, I should add, um, linguists are where it's at. Linguistics has been rebooted and rejuvenated galvanized by funding from quite unlikely sources, and a number of organizations, two of which are represented here today, the Hans Rousing Endangered Languages Project and the organization that Nicholas established and directs, the Foundation for Endangered Languages, are but two of a number of very visible initiatives where linguists are working collaboratively with local communities to document, collect, and protect these oral and linguistic traditions. And the wonderful thing about the sort of the rebirth of linguistics now is that it's a move away from these extractive models of linguist parachutes in, grabs some nice verbs, runs out and publishes, to something that is somehow more engaged with local agendas and the needs of ethnic groups themselves. What are the anthropologists doing? Well, we're thinking about it. There has not been such a concerted response from the field of social anthropology, let alone I mean, wider archaeological and anthropological initiatives in the same way that linguists have been motivated to work. So I'm going to talk a bit about how, as an anthropologist, I came interested in this field, entered it, did my linguistics alongside, and have now established something, I think, in partial response um, to what the linguists have been engaged in. This is a map taken from UNESCO's Atlas of Languages in Danger, made by, principally edited by a colleague, Christopher Mosley. I'd like to zoom in on this map, because since 1996, I've been working in Nepal, northern India, partly in Bhutan, and also in southern Tibet, uh, on some of the endangered languages and the communities who speak them. But let's look at the linguistic diversity to start with. There's an enormous clustering of languages in this part of the eastern Himalayas. If you look further, the different colored dots imply levels of endangerment, so whether they're extinct or very, very endangered or well-documented or safe. And we're going to drill down a little bit further still and see just in this scattering of eastern Nepal, bordering on to Sikkim in northern India, there are about 100 languages spoken. And if we go even further down, you'll see firstly where Tangmi, or Tami, which I studied for a decade, is spoken. And then this map, produced by um, linguists at the summer Institute of Linguistics. Here we see 120 languages represented on just a segment of Eastern Nepal. There's an incredible linguistic diversity in a place like that, and a concomitant cultural diversity as well. That is where Tangmi is spoken, the little red flag, and I'm going to come to it right now. The Tangmi community are about 40,000, and they're dispersed across the Himalayan borders of Nepal, Darjeeling, uh, in West Bengal and Sikkim, and a little bit in Tibet. They speak a distinctive, endangered, Tibeto-Burman language, and they maintain an indigenous system of shamanic ritual practice. Aside from some early studies um, in the 1970s, the language and culture have received very little attention until I started my work in the 1990s. These are two friends of mine from the village that I worked in. On the left, we have a slate miner who carries about 100 kilos of slate on his back, back and forth to the village bazaar, sells it, carries food back to his family, three days' walk. And his wife, on the right, manages the household and the farm. And her necklace is a sign of former glory and wealth because her grandfather had been um, a sort of cook, I think, in the British colonial army in India and had come back with lots of money in coins and of course, over time, this money not only devalued, but when the rupee was changed, essentially they had their inherited health, wealth tied up as a necklace around her neck, worth nothing anymore. But we're talking about an area of eastern Nepal where distance is counted in meals. 
you have two meals a day, and to get somewhere, if it's five meals walk, that means two and a half days walk. Everything is up and down. There is no flat. And in many ways, it's a pre-wheel culture. And I don't mean that in any way as a kind of evolutionary statement or Darwinian statement. The only wheels that are useful are water wheels or prayer wheels, horizontal wheels. These photos um, taken by my wife, Sarah, show the primary ritual practitioners of the Tangmi community, who are known as guru in the Tangmi language. They transmit their myths and their rituals through the recitation of oral texts, and they're chanted at major life cycle rituals, primarily weddings and funerals, calendrical events. And these oral texts are markers of Tangmi identity and belonging. And they're also increasingly important resources in ethnic campaigns for political recognition from the Nepali state. The shamans also act as traditional healers, village doctors, therapists, kind of living Wikipedias of clan affiliation and remembered history. While education is compulsory, many children from the Tangmi community do not regularly go to school for two reasons. First, they're productively useful and necessary for their families. Secondarily, the parents have worked out that nothing that is taught at school is worth knowing. Rote learning, supercilious teachers, and an alienating curriculum, almost entirely disconnected from the realities of rural life in Nepal, have historically excluded the children of marginalized communities from education. The situation is changing for the better, and I've been working for some time now with a local charity to ensure that those children who do want to study and the parents who are willing to support them, but don't have the resources to do so, should actually be able to attend school. But more about that in a minute. Why is Tangmi breaking down? Why is the language endangered? Because intergenerational transmission is collapsing. You have families in which I've lived where the grandparent does not always have an easy language to communicate with the grandchildren in. The grandparents may be not monolingual, but pretty close to monolingual Tangmi speakers. The grandchildren are almost exclusively monolingual Nepali speakers, the national language of Nepal. And the parents sit in between, straddling this sort of weird linguistic divide. Schools have historically, as in Europe, disparaged local languages in the interest of regional integration and national sort of cohesion, nation building. Tangmi also has no written form, so it could not easily be transported into new environments of use. So what we've got is 40,000 farmers, porters and carpenters, shamans, our religious and medical professionals, terribly high levels of poverty, massive levels of debt, 60% interest per annum is a classic kind of interest rate to be extorted from poor Tangmi villages by the local moneylenders. Low education, poor access to healthcare. And the language, as I said, is endangered, Tibeto-Burman, and has no script. But it also has, as we just touched on in the questions, a very complex grammar, but a vocabulary of perhaps around 3,000 words. Elevation and relative distance are all marked in the language, and flora and fauna are extremely lexically elaborate. There's also a ritual language, perhaps more correctly, an elevated ritual register within Tangmi, which is even more endangered than the vernacular, which only the shamans speak. So having worked for many years with the shamans, and I incorporated a number of their oral texts in my dissertation as part of the corpus, which bundled together, together with the grammar and the lexicon, created what I now refer to, and only partly in jest, as my useless dissertation. It's over 900 pages, and it's much anticipated and fetishized by members of the community, perhaps in part because it was so overdue. It was not received altogether well by all members of the community. And as many of you will know here today, the 1990s and the early years of the 21st century were for Nepal one of massive political upheaval and social transformation, with a violent civil war and a level of disturbance like the country had not seen in its recent history. Through this period of unrest, which coincided with my research, the Tangmi community were finding an increasingly, increasingly assertive ethnic voice. And which, kind of, when strung together with all the political transformations of the moment, amounted to a loud chorus proclaiming their ethnic pride, their sense of a traditional homeland, a unique language, and it positioned the group as both visible and needing attention from the fast-changing state. So while all this was happening, some people in the community were still interested in the rather abstract, romantic idea, and then the product of a grammar of their language. But others, and quite understandably, were beginning to ask, what was this for? Who owned it? 
Why on earth was it in English? And how was it going to help them? Now, in part response to these serious and quite understandable questions, I'd already put together what came to be called a Nepali Tami English dictionary, some two years before the dissertation was completed. While I thought this little book might have forestalled some of the criticism, in fact, it in some ways heightened it. And there are five interesting questions that were raised in the course of producing this trilingual booklet. I'd like to touch on them briefly. The first is authorship. How do you credit the person or persons with whom you've written a word list? Has it really been written? Or is a word list not simply compiled, thus without authors? We resolved, my long-term assistant and language teacher and friend, and I find the word informant so terribly unfortunate. And the consultant sounds like it's in a World Bank contract. So um, we decided to list me as the principal author and Bir Bahadur Tami as with. This would, and this was done really, to deflect some of the heat, should there be any negative fallout towards him from this text. There was also a lot of pressure to call the product a dictionary, when in fact, any lexicographer will tell you, it's nothing of the sort. It's a simple word list, with no context or no examples provided. This was, after all, a publication to be used locally rather than internationally acclaimed. And it made sense to provide, to the extent possible, a product that could actually be put in the pocket and used in the village. But the desire was for a dictionary, and the sense was dictionary status and prestige, and a word list looks smaller, also in the Nepali language. So the, the compromise was to use the word dictionary on the cover, and somehow sort of agreeing to the ethnic demands, but actually to refer to the text as a word list within. A very important question, of course, was that of script and ordering. In which orthography should the Tangmi language be written? Should it be in the English script, as in Roman, International Phonetic Alphabet? We had a question about that just now. Or perhaps in Tibetan, reflecting the fact that language is a Tibeto-Burman language. But in fact, no Tangmi have any competence in spoken or written Tibetan. Or how about the Nepali script, the Nagari script, shared also by Hindi and many other Indian languages? While certainly useful, easy to transpose, and widely understood, those Tengmi who had been to school could at least read that script, it also is associated with the hegemonic and dominant forces of Hindu Brahminical power and exploitation. Well, we chose that last script. With entries leading from Nepali, because at least for Nepali, on the left, there is an alphabetical order, which everybody understands, at least those who've had access to Nepali education, believing, we thought at the time, that most potential users would be comfortable or fluent in Nepali first and be searching for Tangmi indigenous words within it. Then there's the very thorny issue of which words to include. At what point does a word become indigenous? At what point does a word become Tangmi? Take the word guru, for example, which, as I unfortunately said to one of the senior shamans in the community, I thought was an Indo-Aryan loan word. He looked at me as if I'd said the worst thing possible and said, hmm, yes, you are right. We don't talk about it much. We have a much older word, which I sometimes use, and that is pundit. <laughs> How long does a word have to be used before it is indigenized, autochthonous, and thought to be something inside? Well, we chose to use, to include words in this word list that really were not transparent loans from Nepali and had some claim to be indigenous, but we were also criticized for that. And finally, the issue really is what do you call this language? Most languages and most people are known by more than one term. Anthropologists like the term ethnonym to describe the ethnic or linguistic cultural grouping, but actually some would, would nuance that and finesse it further and talk about an endonym the language from the perspective of the speaker, the word used by the community to describe themselves, and perhaps an exonym, which is the word that's imposed from the outside. So this is also a struggle. But let's look just for a minute, if you can, at some of the contents. We've got different verbs to chop and to cut, depending on the nature of the action and the size of the object. We've got specific words for insects. There's also an awful lot of kinship terms. There are eight words for uncle and eight words for auntie, depending on whether they are father's elder or father's younger, mother's elder, mother's younger, or married in, as in father's, sister's, husband, etc. Okay, so for, you know, somebody who has only one word, uncle, and only conceives of cousins in the most barbaric manner, 
of course, learning the kinship system was quite a challenge. But look what happened. After centuries of silence and orthographical invisibility, two further dictionaries popped up in rapid response to our one. Both were larger, bigger, and more complete. Dictionaries were suddenly becoming the new unit of value, the flavor of the month, a kind of competitive, productive display of local lexicography. Almost like the archetypical nursery rhyme or fairy tale where dictionaries just get bigger and better, the small, medium, and large. The aspiration, you see, among the community was for a comprehensive Tangmi Nepali dictionary, the OED, as it were, of the language. And our little word list was a humble appetizer, but it was a galvanizer. The gold standard, of course, were these large monolingual dictionaries with lots of local references. How did those other dictionaries become so much bigger? By pangmifying, indigenifying Nepali words and taking every single possible verbal conjugation and putting those in as separate lexical entries. The idea, of course, was to bolster the size, the weight, the number of the words, to be able to show the government and other ethnic groups in the area that their language was robust. And what I produced, this flimsy little booklet, was actually not going to help them politically much. So this question remained. How could the massive difference between the size of my dissertation and the size of my tiny dictionary be explained? What was in the English one, the foreign one, that was not in the Nepali local one? What was I leaving out? with the community being shortchanged. Now, I don't want to spend too much more time on these issues. There's a lot of ground to cover, but I, I'm sure you can see how this ties into what Nicholas was talking about, the ethics of what we're doing. So what are the two main points here? First, such collaborations are always contested. The simple refrain that we hear among some of our students and also colleagues of giving back to the community, sounds more like a political broadcast than anything else, is much more problematic than it first may appear. There are many communities. And what appears at first glance to be the right thing to do can set off a chain of consequences which can be quite unexpected. But second, in those contestations, in those discussions and negotiations, lie very interesting research questions. And these only bubble up when you start to connect and engage with local indigenous demands. This process is intellectually fulfilling. It's not just a mechanical process of repatriating materials or some moral imperative to give back. So having been standardized with some agreement across the speech community, the challenge was now that Tangmi was a suddenly a written language with nothing to read. There was no literature. Nothing had ever been written in Tangmi. Now, through an organization in Kathmandu, we organized for two young literate members of the community to attend a workshop and write a short novella each. One of them was my long-term research assistant and friend um, who visited Cambridge this last summer and whose novel was about a disastrous trek that he and I took, sneaking in across the border of Tibet to find some of his long lost cousins. Uh, we then fell down the mountain, as you can see, in the artist's impression of our journey. It's hard to convey the symbolic importance and power of seeing your own language in print for the first time. Hardened village elders, wizened shamans, almost always illiterate, would dissolve into tears as they watched their grandchildren read aloud from a book in Tangmi. As until that point, books, learning, script, and power were all bundled together to exclude them and their culture. They had, as it were, joined the club. So through these little books, then school books with local content, local art, and local language have been part of the movement of kind of revitalizing Tangmi, and I've been very proud to be part of it. Let me move on now from dictionaries and school books and return to the documentation of culture, of oral and ritual tradition, which I've been involved with for some years now. This photo shows the late Lati Appa from Darjeeling in India. He's called Lati Appa because of his immensely long head knot, which you can see. He was a powerful shaman. He was a compelling storyteller and a master of symbolic manipulation, whose magnetic appeal was not lost on my then two-year-old son, with whom he developed a very strong bond. And he named my son Itihas Tami, which means history Tami. As it was for this coming generation, our son and his grandchildren, that he was working with us so intensively to record his oral texts and his cultural knowledge. I showed these photos of Latte Apa to acknowledge his massive contribution to our work, but also to underscore the impermanent nature 
of the holders of such traditions. He died, tragically, in a monsoon landslide in Darjeeling last year. His was the only house that was destroyed, and he was the only victim. The first topic of discussion among the Tangmi community in Darjeeling on waking up and discovering his death was who would conduct his funeral ritual, as he had been for so long the only expert shaman helping the souls of the dead come to rest. His violent and untimely death underscores to me the fragility of such knowledge and the urgency involved in the documentation of such traditions. In January 2009, really out of a number of different initiatives that I'd been working on for some years, grew the World Oral Literature Project. And it really grew out also of an appreciation of the large amount of innovative work being done by linguists and a sense that anthropologists had to respond somehow. Linguists were not always able, trained, or interested to document cultural content. Perhaps kinship terminology would be an example. I have linguists who are fascinated by kinship terms, but they're interested in mining them for their cognate structures and how they relate to other languages of the area. Very respectable linguistics. Anthropologists are interested in what those relationships tell us about the society and the community. It's essential, of course, that cultural matter gets collected by professionals who are committed to the rigorous analysis and documentation. Why oral literature? Well, it sounds like an oxymoron, but I believe that it's a term due for some rehabilitation. The term underscores both the method of transmission and the sense that these traditions are on a par with the Western literate traditions that make up our oeuvre of inherited knowledge and learning. And in any culture and society, oral literature could include many different forms, ritual texts or chants, epic poems, musical genres, folk tales, creation myths, songs, spells, proverbs, riddles, tongue twisters, all of this oral cultural content. Remember, we're talking about languages that usually do not have established written traditions, even if they are in the process of becoming lexicalized. But why now? Well, for many communities around the world, the transmission of oral literature from one generation to the next is at the heart of the cultural practice they hold. But performances of such creative works are increasingly endangered. Globalization and rapid socioeconomic change exert complex pressures on small communities. They erode expressive diversity and somehow transform culture to more dominant ways of life. As vehicles for the transmission of unique cultural knowledge, languages encode oral traditions that become threatened when elders die or when livelihoods are disrupted. In the World Oral Literature Project, we essentially have four programmatic aspects. The first is a supplemental grant program, about which I'll talk in a minute. We also help the digitization and archiving of heritage or sometimes orphaned collections. We run a series of workshops and lectures. We have a series of publications, monographs that are coming out, occasional papers, and also a special issue of a journal that came out from SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies. And it's a journal of which Peter is the managing editor. We also have a database, which I'll touch on in a minute, really trying to get a sense of the scope of the work that we have ahead of us and the level of documentation of oral traditions that has already been done. About the supplemental grants program, we've given out a number of grants in the last two years. And there's something unique about our program, partly, I think, because we're so small. The first is we have no application form and we have no deadlines. We can afford to do that in large part because we are such a small grant giving project. Our focus is entirely on documentation and not on theory. Perhaps most importantly, the grants we give out are often to indigenous researchers or community cultural organizations partnering with an established anthropologist or linguist. We encourage these people to apply. Until the government removed them, there were very good forms of local funding for British academics, such as the British Academy Small Grants Program. American academics have access to resources. Many universities have their own research funds. But what if you are a community organization based in India and your government isn't giving you anything? You don't know where to apply. We felt this is the kind of thing that we should support. The people who fall through the gaps, who have a robust research agenda, but don't know where to get funding from. So in the last two years, we've had actually now close to 100 expressions of interest, 30 proper proposals submitted, 18 projects funded, and four others under review pending further funding coming to us. 
This is what I call the research triangle, and it's something that we're increasingly seeing. How does one actually work in partnership? And how are technology and globalization changing the relationships that people have uh, with the content they study? There's a paradox in this, the paradox of globalization. The very process that is eroding diversity is also bringing people into closer contact with one another, providing the tools to document these vanishing worlds in a way that is ever more nuanced and ever cheaper. Let me address that simply with this photo taken by Marion Wettstein of her husband, Alban von Stockhausen, on the left, and two local researchers. One is the shaman in the middle, Dirga Bahadur Dumi Rai, in Kotang district in eastern Nepal, 2006. But on the right, the interesting part of this story, and one that we're increasingly seeing in the field, is that a local researcher is involved recording his language, his culture, for his agenda. And if you look at the shaman, he's speaking in this photo to the local researcher. And this kind of research triangulation, where different people are coming to it for different agendas, maybe ethnic pride, maybe local language materials, maybe a dissertation, a PhD advancement, is increasingly part of the research nexus. An outside researcher is not the only person anymore. There are local researchers, and in this case, it's to him the shaman is speaking. One of the changes that's going hand in hand with these documentation projects is the transformation and the role of the position of archives and museums. Archives are no longer physical places where collections and things go to die, curated exclusively by Western universities and institutions. But archives are increasingly online virtual environments that hold living traditions and access conditions are minimal if at all, present. Our Museum of Anthropology in Cambridge is a very good example. It's the forefront of debates about cultural ownership, physical or digital repatriation, access and preservation. And it's a tribute to the flexibility and energy of museum curators that communities are increasingly choosing for partnership, where the physical object remains in a Western holding in good climate control conditions, but that digital rights, avatars and access are controlled by the descendants of the communities whose cultural heritage we are privileged to protect. In fact, the very rhetoric of archives has changed enormously, and part of this relates to the democratization of archival space. We have increasingly things called community archives, and archives are tying together with heritage groups, self-archiving. Anyone now can be an archivist. It's not a protected title. Pushing out open the concept that was previously so cherished and somehow protected. And much of the impetus for this is technological, but it's not the only impetus. Increasingly, ever few of my students can be found in a place like this. We have ever fewer places like this. And we've also seen a return of kind of the librarian, not with catalog card indexes, but in this way, librarians, the original search engine. Librarians are becoming partners in our research exercises. Yeah? And increasingly, students realize that librarians may be more important than their professors in terms of accessing resources and helping them find what they need. So partnerships between linguists, anthropologists, curators, librarians, and archivists is exactly what I think is happening right now. It's a terribly exciting time to be involved in such things. This is a slide from the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. Now, I've got many good friends of the Pitt Rivers, so I do this not to shame them, but to show you a conceptual problem, which is exactly where the World Oral Literature Project sits. If you go to their elegant website and you want to interrogate the museum collections online through their catalog, you have to make a decision. It's in tiny print up there in black, so only those in the first row can read it. But there are two black boxes. One says, search the object database. And the other one says, search the photo database. And what happens? if your content falls into neither category. Recordings, oral literature, song, what is it? Is it a photo, an object? A missionary linguist by the name of John Whitehorn, who'd worked in Taiwan in the 1950s, turned up at the Cambridge University Museum of Anthropology a few years ago with all of his recordings and all of his work and said to the man at the front desk, I'm old and I think you should have it. Will you take it? They went through it and they sort of filleted it the best bits. But also, they took the bits that they could curate, the bits that they could understand and make use of and fit within their typology of classification of how you deal with objects and rugs and documents. And they sent him home with his plastic bags full of his tape recordings of songs. Two years later, he read an article about the project in the newspaper and turned up at the museum again with his plastic bags and said, do you want the tapes now then? 
In other words, he'd been waiting for the moment. Fieldwork is inherently multimodal. Fieldwork was immersive. People who did it, linguists or anthropologists, made use of all manner of recording techniques. When they returned home to their home institutions, often those collections were sent to different places according to media. Oh, your documents go to the archive, your films go to the photo archive, etc., etc. So that immersive moment of documentation, which is so rich, was not sustained during archiving. And that is where we're coming to with digital archives. These are some of the projects that we are involved in. And there are two types. There are those projects who we funded, those are the ones in blue, and those are the ones that we've not funded, the red ones. And increasingly we're seeing, as the project gains visibility, a number of scholars, including John Whitehorn and many others, who send us often unsolicited their collections and say, you take it now, you worry about it. And the beautiful thing about digital collections is that you don't have to own it yourself. We can host it, disseminate it, be a platform for it, but simply not retain copyright. We don't exert any intellectual property. We help disseminate and connect the materials when it's appropriate. And we certainly digitize them for posterity and archiving. We started a publication series, which is to support the immediate dissemination of research findings and methodological considerations. This is just the first four of our occasional papers, but we're also embarking on uh, a bigger project with a Cambridge-based publisher, the Open Book Publishers. What I think is interesting about Open Book is that their, their idea is that increased access is only a good thing, but open access is not free access. Increasingly to publish very dense texts of shamanic oral stories from Nepal is either impossible or so expensive that only the most exclusive publishers will take us. Um, I'm fortunate to say that Harvard Oriental series are looking at our manuscript right now, and if they do produce it, it'll be available for only a couple of hundred dollars, so I warmly encourage everybody here to buy a stocking filler or two. But that really is not the future of academic publishing, is it? Because firstly, you lock it down to six university libraries around the world, and not to the communities of interest back in the host home country or the source community who might one day use this. And what open book publishers are doing is basically trumping Google and saying, well, instead of waiting for Google to digitize it, we'll give it to Google. It's free online to view, PDF you can download for a couple of quid, and if you want a book, we'll print it on demand. Basically, the intellectual property remains with the, with the author, the publisher is a partner, and dissemination is enriched. So these are very important initiatives, and I think this whole open access movement, open archives movement, is one that we as a scholarly community need to take very seriously right now. That's our website, and I'm going to end, really, with this phrase, collect, protect, connect. We have now a unique opportunity, but also a challenge before us. There are, I think, more professionally trained linguists and more professionally trained anthropologists than there are languages and cultures. And while we know the most unusually detailed things about aspects of English, French, Latin, and Sanskrit, we still know next to nothing about most of the world's speech forms. We need modest resources as a scholarly community to fund urgent anthropology in the field and to support the digitization of these legacy historical materials so that they are future-proofed and they don't become orphaned collections in a shoebox in someone's attic. We need partnerships, we need open standards, knowledge networks, and communities of practice so that we can act in a coordinated way to document these oral cultures before they disappear without record. In short, we need more people to know this story, and we need your support. Thank you. Well, a really exciting, very practical look <laughs> at what actually <laughs> needed to be done, <laughs> is being done, right. and remarkable the way in which the technology at long last is actually doing what we want it to do rather than doing what the technology will allow us mm -hmm. which is what my particular generation of academics kept on coming up against and that really is very encouraging um, we have some time before the break we have a question at the back there sophie can i be heard yes yes, yes. thank you for a fascinating talk you said that books are given to Google for free, and that if one wanted to, one could get a physical copy. But what is the quality of this physical copy? 
Very good question. Um, good. The physical copy is good. You can order a paperback or a hardback. And the hardback is about £25, usually, for a normal size, normal, decent-sized book, and a paperback about £15. Um, it's the same kind of binding, perfect binding, or stitch binding that's used in normal commercial trade presses. Uh, the only question, the only point, really, is that they don't produce a print run. They're printed on demand and distributed directly from the printing house, as it were. In, in, such a, in, in, that, in the area, for example, of East Nepal, if there are so many languages, to what extent are the um, uh, variations of, uh, to what extent are the dialects uh, variations of a sort of dominant language uh, or separate languages within themselves? Right. Um, they're very much the latter. If you start counting dialects or variations, as you rightly said, we'd probably be talking about quite a few hundred, three or four hundred. Um, my professor, I mean, I did my PhD in the Netherlands. Um, I left Cambridge to, to go to the Netherlands to, to work with a specific professor who was standing one day on top of a valley, sort of well, on top of a mountain, looking down four valleys, and realized that in each valley, a different language was spoken. At that point, he said, I can't do it all myself. I need research students. And he got some money from the Rolex Award for Enterprise and also the Dutch government and recruited a whole lot of PhD students. They are, like that question earlier about how do these languages actually come to exist, why are there so many languages? Partly because most of these small communities are self-sufficient ecologically and, I mean, agriculturally. It's a very diverse area in flora and fauna as well. Strong correlation there with linguistic diversity. And people do not marry outside of their ethnic group. So you get a kind of involution culturally. And the topography is also so dramatic that it's hard to get across these mountains. Um, these languages are mutually unintelligible to each other. And it's just phenomenal. You just walk one village and there's another language spoken. Hello. Um, what will happen, because presumably it will happen, when these cultures will stop being self-sufficient, as in with globalization? I was wondering if you could say a couple of words about the evolution of languages. Because what you were saying about oral traditions, it seems to me, that the problem is the same everywhere around the world, that even I, um, I know fewer poems, I know fewer names of plants than my parents, my grandparents would have done. Mm -hmm. So whereas you're talking about the, the conversation uh, of languages, um, if the mother's sister mm -hmm. is not known to the child anymore because the child has moved to a city, um, will that language be able to survive? Hmm. as it changes form? I mean, it's a fundamental question, and I thank you for that. I think the answer is that there's remarkable innovation and a sign of hope, as well as the kind of story of inevitable decline. And that is the story of languages bouncing back, of revitalization programs, languages on the brink of disappearance that have been through popular demand, as it were, through ethnic awareness and through state support, been revitalized and reborn. Um, we spoke about Welsh earlier today, but there are other examples as well. What you need, I think, is resources coming from the top down. It doesn't always mean money, but it can mean that. And it certainly means support. Benign will to live is as good um, as money sometimes. But also you need grassroot interest from, from the ground. And when those two intersect, you can see interesting survival strategies. The language that I, that I worked on was actually innovating, neologisms, new words were being coined all the time, in part to describe some of the things that we were being confronted with, books and cars and uh, watches and audio recorders. So that's remarkably um, dynamic. But there is an issue of resourcing here. Um, the American government has just announced that it's cutting the Fulbright Doctoral Hayes program. So the Fulbright program, as many people know it, has been cut. The whole Fulbright program costs the same as four US missiles, right, to be used in Libya. So it's just a question of what you prioritize. If it is important to get people out there learning about the world, which I do believe, and if we believe as a community of linguists and scholars that this is part of our inherited condition as a species, this is what makes us unique as a species, it is just a moral travesty not to do something about it. So as Nick mentioned earlier, documentation has to be part of it. Dissemination at the end. But in the middle, you've got this kind of interesting question of protection. And I think we're at that time right now. We have to do something. And to watch the whole field disappear around our ears, and then wonder in 20 years from now why linguists had nothing to study, would be a disaster. 
Now, this is why I do some firm chairmanship. The word documentation was mentioned, <laughs> and this, in fact, is a subject of our next topic at five past four with uh, Peter. There will be time for questions when we have the panel discussion starting at 4.45, so we can then take questions on virtually um, any of the topics, anything which has been said by the speakers. Um, I would like to call a short break. I think the weather has held outside if you'd like to stretch your legs uh, in the courtyard and be back here at uh, five past four. But in the meantime, thank you very much indeed, Mark, for amazing insights. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Mark.